Arts Center. On behalf of Community Media Bookstore, I'd like to thank Little Brown Publishing Company and the Art Center for partnering with us um, for this event. Community Hands hosts over more than the last eight years, so if you're looking for um, more information about that, you can visit us on our website at communitymedia.com and also on social media, which is just ridiculous on the various platforms. So, it was spring of 2005, I was a children's book buyer at Jimmy Jimmy's bookstore, and one of my publishers sent me an advanced copy of a book that they were really excited about. It was a vampire novel by the author. As my rep put it, we think it will sell well. <laughs> um, as I read Twilight, I knew it was going to be a huge deal. I just didn't quite at the time, realized how important it would be and how important my friendship with the author would become. <laughs> Fast forward, four Twilight books, one movie, and one eclipse prom later to 2009, at which point I was diagnosed with breast cancer without insurance. Sorry. It was it was then that Stephanie, the Twilight fandom, and ten other mineral authors came together to fundraise for my medical expenses. It was it was generous, it was kind, it was an action I would never forget as long as I live. Mm, sorry. <laughs> so I'm currently seven years cancer free. Thanks to you. And that is a uh, thanks in large part to that one single act of kindness. <clears throat> so it's been seven, or sorry, it's been 11 years since Twilight's release, and it has indeed sold well. Um, <laughs> and because of its popularity, it's it's opened the door for a flood of amazing books by talented authors. Um, one of those authors just happens to be Rainbow Rowell, and she's the best-selling author of Eleanor and Park, which you can now um, get as a limited collector's edition with a brand new dust jacket and some stunning pieces of fan art. They're really fantastic. Um, so uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome Stephanie Meyer and Rainbow Rowell. Okay. It's very bright. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, thanks, Faith. And Stephanie, thank you for letting me come to Arizona to ask you a lot of personal questions. <laughs> that have nothing to do with anything you guys want to know. It's all me. That's awesome. They're specifically awesome. just about New Moon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure all the New Moon fans will be really excited, so perfect. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening. All right, should we dive right in? Yes, How are you let's feeling do it. good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Stephanie. <laughs> the idea, oh, so I've read a couple of places that the idea for Twilight came to you in a dream which seems like such a cheat to me. Like, I'm getting, I'm getting nothing from my dreams. But when I was reading The Chemist, I was like, what kind of dreams is she having now? <laughs> so where did the idea that for The Chemist come from, and, and when? Oh, I had these dates, too. It's been a while. Um, the Chemist <laughs> has been uh, progressing for a long time. Um, but a very long time ago, it was not a dream. It was the opposite of a dream. It was sleep deprivation. Um, I was on set for the last Breaking Dawn movie, so I think that makes it 2011, 12? I'm not sure. Um, and Wait, let me look at my tattoos. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things on a movie set, you have a lot of free time and nothing to do, and so we all kind of sat around and we'd kick around other ideas for movies. I remember there was a, a found footage Santa Claus movie, but it was a horror movie. Um, so it was, yeah, it was weird. We had different things, and... Uh, I had the idea that turned into The Chemist as a, an idea for a film, 
Um, and I don't remember where it came from. I just remember pitching it to my production partner. And I don't think she was that into it. But then we were really tired. <laughs> it was like 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, so, and I, but I kind of liked it. Mm -hmm. I wrote it down in my... I kind of like it. I have, I have a file where I keep all the ideas that I don't want to forget. And really? I, can we, can, maybe we should just look at them later. <laughs> hopefully, it, hopefully I still have the file. My computer's a mess. Um, but I, uh, then I saw a movie that was called The Bourne Legacy. And I really like all the Bourne movies, but this was like the, the science fiction, and there were super soldiers, and they were genetically engineered, and that was so my thing. And uh, this is a long story, sorry. Um, we're only going to ask one question tonight, okay, so that's, that's fine. So we're good. Okay, only question. Um, so after I saw this movie five or six times in the theater with my best friend, um, her birthday was coming up. We were really super into it. We had made necklaces. We tried to make bags. It didn't work. Um, so for her birthday, for the first time in my entire life, I wrote fan fiction. What? I wrote an, a sequel to that movie. Really? I did. And it was really fun. And did I you just put it online? No, 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 no. I shot a lot of people. It was great. I had so much fun. She loved it. We kind of had our own little world for a while. And then when I was like, okay, I need to write something, I wanted to keep killing people. It was really, I mean, it's really fun. And so I'm like, how, oh, I had that idea with, and that had a lot of violence. Let's go find that. And so that's You're how in your I started. style going, where are, the, where are those bodies? Yeah, where's the one with all the guns? So that was sort of where I went from there. Cool. Well, I am so impressed with your ability to shift gears as an author. Um, the host, which I loved, was totally different from Twilight. And now this is totally different from the host or from Twilight. Um, and I was wondering, is that, a, is that an intentional shift for you? Or are you like, okay, now for something totally different? Or, or are you just sort of naturally shifting? I think it's a subconscious thing. Like the host, for example, I was in the middle of editing Eclipse, I think, and I needed something that was completely different. You know, my mind was so, it was becoming homework. You know how editing, well, some people love editing. I am not one of those people. Um, I like writing the rough draft when everything is fine and there are no mistakes, and then you have to go and fix everything that was wrong, and it's kind of a grind. So I just needed an escape from my original escape. And the host came out of that. And so I think I, my mind gets tired of being in one world, and then I want to go be somewhere else. So, it just, so you're sort of getting done with one thing, and you find yourself wanting to go in a totally different yeah. when direction. I, when I want to sit down and write a story again, it's something that's completely different usually. I think that's very brave. Does it's it only do, brave if you brave? do it on purpose. All right, okay. I, I think it's but just... Like me, actually. I do it on purpose. Um, <laughs> were you intimidated? to Because be, I feel like this is a huge, a huge shift from the host. I think the intimidation happened when I had to start researching things because I wrote the whole story without that and then I had to find out what was real. My um, editor in New York, who's awesome, but she watches a lot of like spy shows like Homeland and stuff and so she has this version of the world where we are all little red dots on a giant map and they at any time can hear everything we're doing. They know they're watching us all the time and, and, and I, th I felt like that was not super realistic and so I wanted to make this more of what they're actually capable of and so I had to talk to a lot of really serious people and find out how much I don't know and but in the end I was glad actually you can get away with a lot in this world they don't they don't watch us all the time I mean, that's a funny thing to say because we're on Facebook live right now I know I yeah. know well now so, they're watching thank you for joining us Facebook live um and, and was your editor cool with it like was, did anyone say to you mm, maybe not this for you no, no. Um, my editor, I'm going to out her now, has, is the only other one who was like a part of the fan fiction thing because she also loved The Born Legacy. So she kind of made me feel validated that I could do the thriller thing. Nobody, nobody gave me any pushback because, you know, I feel like it's cool. Very, like that's a very cl clever to kind of go out and do it secretly to see if you could. Test the waters yeah, first. Yeah, test the waters. Yeah. See what feels. Actually, I think that that's a lot of people write fan fiction in that way. <laughs> um, one of the things I like best about this book, or about your books, is the way that you write ense ensembles. So you're great at kind of like, um, I especially felt like this in the Twilight movies, or in the, twi in the Twilight books, that you'd have everybody in a room and you almost don't even need dialogue tags when you're reading those scenes because you know, you always know who is saying what because the characters are so strong and they're, they're really just coming together. Um, and I was wondering, when you were writing The Chemist, it's a smaller cast. Um, but did you have a character who, who you really loved writing, who you were trying to get into scenes? I, I, have, I have a favorite character from oh, the cast. Oh, now I want to know. Who's your favorite character? Oh, it's the, it's the tough brother. 
You like have, yeah, see, and, so and, and actually, I am more of a Daniel person. I, I In think life, because, I'm more of a Daniel person. Well, I mean, I identify with the person who I have never had any martial arts training. Right. I can't do anything. So I can imagine being thrust into a world where your life is at stake and I would fail miserably. So I, I get that. I understood him. Mm -hmm. Kevin's so annoying. I but, thought he was so funny. Well, I mean, he's funny, but I, my, my agent and my, and my editor both liked him best, and yeah. I found that very annoying. It's like, oh, wait, but he's a jerk. He's not nice. Yeah, but every time, it's, like, it's kind of a, I mean, I, are we spoiling tonight? Do, we didn't really talk I about mean, it. I mean, it's been, it's been how long since the book came out? And nobody said spoil, anything right? to do, but really think about this book and read it, I think. So. <laughs> well, we all need an escape, so. <laughs> but yeah, so we're going to spoil it a little bit. So Kevin, who is one of the twins, yes. uh, every time he came into the, into the room, though, it's such a heavy book, heavy Everyone's in danger all the time. And so when he would walk in, I'd be like, oh, he's here. He's going to make me laugh. So I really See, no, it. that's interesting because I was just talking to my mom recently, mm -hmm. and she was reading it in the hardcover format instead of in, in yeah. the final version. And she said how, you know, it's just so stressful and tense. And then Daniel shows up. And all of a sudden, oh. everything gets a little lighter and a little and, a, and softer. He softens the world. So I have, and, and, I, and that was how oh, I felt too, that it was Daniel that then made everything easier and happier. I felt like Daniel walks in, you're really relaxed, but like Daniel's never going to save me from a sniper. And this is true. <laughs> this is true. Okay. But then hopefully, I mean, I guess my feeling is hopefully I don't need to be saved from a sniper. Hopefully not tonight. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of... <laughs> <laughs> Stop saying that. Knock on wood or something, for God's sakes. Um, <laughs> okay, well, here, I think this is a question we might all like to hear. Is there a character from your previous books you just can't get rid of, who kind of, like, nags you, stays on your, you know, your shoulder, that you might write about again? You know, I feel like I'm usually able to, especially when I'm working on a different story, yeah. I can close the door, and I'm not there. But every now and then, you hear a song on the radio. I don't yeah. know about you, but my characters, I know what they like. I know what foods they like, what music they listen to. And I'll hear a song, and then that'll be, you know, a Jacob song. Mm -hmm. Or it'll be an Ian song. Or it'll be Wanda talking to me through the radio. And so it's, they, they come back that way sometimes. But, yeah, but I feel not like... not one persistently here. You're like, oh. No, no. It's the, it's the whole range. Oh, lots wow. of, lots of voices chorus. in the head. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Something that did surprise me about The Chemist is that it has, this is kind of, this is really spoilerly, it has an epilogue. And I don't know, I was really surprised, like I didn't, ex I turned the page and I was like, oh, I'm going to get to find out where these people are now. And I was wondering, as you were writing, did you know there's going to be an epilogue and I'm going to, or, or, or did you kind of add it later? Where did that happen? Well, that is the second epilogue. There is an original epilogue and I really was trying, I'm just really behind right now. I wanted to get it up on my website before tonight so oh. that people could go and see it. That would be cool. And I wanted to have the cool people who do my website get that, that gif of Wayne's World where they're doing the super mega happy ending, you know, doodle doodle doodle, because that's what it is. It is the super mega happy ending. Um, and I guess it was a little too happy, and so it bumped some people. They're like, this is just too sweet. Really? So then I, I wrote one that had a little distance. It doesn't change anything from the super happy ending. It just gives you a, an outsider's perspective on it. I'm really trying to imagine who these people were who were like, this is too happy. You know some of them. Really? I think they're right over there. Uh, <laughs> I'm all for the super happy. I would, I, I would, I'll, I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it up. I just have to finish like the, my editor went through and edited the whole thing in case, but she said you probably shouldn't use it. So I, at the time, I'm like, well, I'm not going to do the homework if I can't get credit. That's what it's about for you, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Well, I really loved it because I, you're so invested in the character's safety and who they are, and they're always in danger. And so it was like a chance to kind of go, <sighs> okay. Well, and I think that as a writer, you probably would get this. Um, but if you write a story about characters and you don't get them to that safe place, then they're always there, you know, in yeah, trouble. Totally. And it, they haven't been resolved. I had a problem with that in the Twilight novels um, because Jacob's unhappy for a really long time. And, like, yeah. until I got to where I could write his happy ending, it, there was no peace. I think it's, maybe I'll disagree. I think it's especially difficult when you're writing young characters to leave yes. them there. No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you said, uh, you've said when you were writing Twilight um, that you didn't feel like you were writing a novel. You were almost just writing down the dream. Um, and that you, that you never thought that you could be an author, that that seemed like some sort of like really far away magical thing to be. Um, and I'm wondering, now you are just undisputably an author. You can't, you cannot say that anymore. And so how has the writing experience really changed for you? 
I mean, I think I could dispute that. I know that that oh sounds... My God. No, it's We're totally an author. <laughs> It sounds weird, but at the same time, it's such a strange thing for me still to think that I am an author. That sounds strange and odd to me and presumptive. I feel like it would be strange if you said you were something else. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I still, when I write, I lie to myself. Um, I can't write if I think I'm going to publish. I have to tell myself, this is just for me, and no one else will ever see this except, you know, maybe Megan and my mom and my yeah. sister. And, and then that helps me get through the the stage right because it's really bad when the book comes out it feels just like you're walking out onto a stage like this one but you don't know what your lines are and you're not sure what play you're in um it's it's terrifying and so i have to tell myself that moment's never going to come if i'm going to finish anything do you do you have any sense though of like this is a river i have crossed before i know that i can get across a river that's kind of how it felt for me the second or third time it probably should feel that way. I don't know. Maybe there's something Maybe wrong with me. Maybe you should start it calling doesn't. me, and I'll be like, no, you've done this before. You can totally do it. But, you know, sometimes that makes it worse. I have done this before, so I know what's coming, and that, and that adds to the stage fright. Oh, well, I, I think you've done it well many times. And that you You're saying a whole lot of really nice things about me, by the way, tonight, just in general. <laughs> and I just want you to know I appreciate that. It's very nice. You don't have to thank me every time. <laughs> I, they're all sincere. Um, okay, I feel like you're in a friendly room. Probably yeah, everyone seems, is agreeing with like me. Yeah. <laughs> we all think that you can start writing author on your passport or whatever, <laughs> you know, if, if you would like to. Um, okay, so when I write, I very intentionally do not think about the audience or who might be reading it. Um, and it sounds like that you do something very similar. Um, has that shifted at all? Like, because you do have loyal and supportive readers. You can't, I mean, I still can't think about that because while I have lovely readers and a lot and of them very good looking I think oh, so beautiful yeah. really the the hottest yeah. readers in the world right. but all these beautiful hot readers want different things and all yes. the things that they want generally are good but there's stories that they want to see and it's not the same as the person sitting next to them right. and if I tried to write a story that got everyone even in just this room I would be it wouldn't work for anyone right. um, and so if I think about what other people want it's crippling you know you can't yeah. you can't work through it so it has to just be a story that makes me happy and then if other people like it, then that's just the bonus. You mentioned your sister before. And is, is that the sister who talked you into getting Twilight or trying to get it published? My older sister was the one who read along with me when I was writing Twilight and kind of gave me the, the courage I needed to yeah. send those letters to agents, which was the scariest thing I think I've ever done. It was terrifying. Um, I still can't drive by that mailbox. I'm glad I don't live on that side of town anymore because it just gives me stomach aches to go buy it still. Um, but I also have a little sister who is, my big sister moved away and lives far away, and so I don't see her as much. But right. sisters are great. Sisters are really good to have around. Now, are they still your, your first readers then? No, no. Life has gotten busy. They all have kids and different, you know. <laughs> don't you love that, like, now they're like, um, maybe I, if I can get to it, I'll read it. I don't know. You know, and I, I think if I send it to them and said, here's a chapter, read it, they totally would, either one of them. Actually, my brothers would be pretty cool about that, too. Um, but it's just like it's intrusive, right? I know right. she's got all the soccer tournaments this weekend. I don't want to send her something that's like, going to be a problem, so... You know, I, she feels like she's already made your career. She's already like gotten. She's her. done her work. She's good now. Um, I I was really thrilled to get to meet your boys, two of your boys, this this weekend, um, and I was wondering. I was thinking as I was I was looking at them that for most of their lives they've known you as they also know that you're an author, so they've known you as you know my mom who's done who's written the Twilight books and so. Do they think of you, or what's, what do you think it's been like for them to grow up with you as their mom as Stephanie Meyer? Rough, really yeah. rough. In fact, my 16-year-old, uh, when he was in middle school, changed his name to Bertram for a while. This is Bertram. He didn't want his people... His last name or his first his name? His first name. He didn't want people to know who he was. He had a fake name so that he could be someone different. I feel like the last name would have been more effective. <laughs> He was 12. I guess. Um, there might have been a last name. He gave me one, too. I was Claire Wilson for a while. That was my name. 
um, because they didn't, you know, it's embarrassing, I think mm -hmm. particularly for boys, which is a sadness for me because I think there, there's this stigma with girls' books and boys' books. And girls could read boys' books, and that's nothing. But if a boy has a girls' book, you know, oh. My youngest loved Anne of Green Gables until he started taking the book to school with him and people made fun of him and then he wouldn't read it anymore, which just broke my heart. I love Anne of Green Gables. But there is that thing. And so their mom writes girl books. And, and it know, was unavoidable. It's not like it was something you could have, like, hit, you know, protected them from. No. No, well, I mean, I should have used a fake name, and I would have, too, but, like, right. the... It's a business, right? I, I wrote to my agent with my real name because I'm going to have a working relationship with her, and, and I didn't think I had to tell them right away, don't, oh, by the way, don't say anything about my name until I figure out what it's going to be, but they put it out there right away, and I How didn't have to... arrogant. Look, I might be very big. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to need a fake name. If you could just hold. <laughs> Not at all. That wasn't what I was thinking. I just wanted to keep it a deep, dark secret from everyone I knew. Right, right. So, like, someone wouldn't say, did you write a... I saw this thing with your name. Is that you? And so, instead, it'd be yes, Claire Wilson, awesome. and I'd be like, yeah, I don't know who that Claire Wilson is. So, have, have Bertram and the other boys read th any of your novels? No. I don't think what? they've read any happens? of them. No, no. My, I read part of... I think it was Eclipse. I would read it. I found that I went through a phase where I'd read them out loud because I heard the mistakes yeah, more totally. when I was, I when that, I was yeah. copy editing. Um, and so I'd read to them at night, and, and they're like, Mom, we just want to go to sleep. Leave us alone. <laughs> so so I quit. you would read... Well, first of all, because you started in the middle. I mean, I wouldn't... Uh, they weren't listening. It didn't matter. <laughs> So they're just like walking around the house and you're like, and then Edward said. No, no, this is a bedtime. They'd get in bed. <laughs> you read that as a bedtime story. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now, hold up here. There's nothing, my, when I, I mean, grew, I'm also reading a clip to my nine-year-old right now, but go ahead. <laughs> they were older. When, okay. I, when I was a kid, the way I learned to love reading is my dad would read to us every night at bedtime, and I loved it. And he wouldn't read kids' books. He'd read whatever he was reading. And the first big book I ever read was The Sword of Shannara, by Terry Brooks, and he was reading it to us, the fans, yay, and, uh, and he would stop at like the most exciting part. So then I would sneak into his closet and read during the day, because for some reason I thought I wouldn't have been allowed, I'm not, maybe I wouldn't, I don't know. So I just read ahead in the book and discovered that, you know, books, the bigger the better, because the story doesn't end very fast, and that I never felt like, oh, that that's too adult for me. I think I was seven when I was doing this. I was wow. little, but I didn't know that I couldn't read big books, and so then I, I never had that. So I, I don't ever think you should only read little kids' books or age-appropriate. No, just read I, what you're reading. I'm just saying, it. like, you started in the middle of the series. But, but it's okay. Make, it didn't take. They make you really? write all that stuff at the beginning to catch people up if they start there. It's <laughs> fine. But it didn't, they haven't read them. And that's probably yeah. intentional, right? They probably, oh, yeah. it's like a little weird. What about their friends? Um, I mean, I've signed books for some of their friends yeah. and, and mostly their girlfriends, you know, it's not, <laughs> it's not the, the boys, much. although a couple of boys have had me sign stuff for them. Right. The friends are way cooler about it. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. All right. Um, now, your life is not just books. More and more your, of your work life is taken up by movies. Um, and I, um, well, I should shout out the name of your company, Ficklefish. Yeah. So you produced... Some of the Twilight movies, the ones at the end, right? Yes. Um, also, Austin Land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, why? Why do, why do that? Why get involved in movies? Well, I mean, that's. I mean, I feel like you were doing really well in books, <laughs> and I would have been like, "No, I'm good." <laughs> I mean, part of it was. Uh, as the movies are going on, becoming, having a producer credit, being right. able to be more involved, just lets you have a little more control and keep the story closer to what you want. Um, but the, uh, then I also, I love to read, and I've always been someone who reads and pictures the story. And a, Shannon Hale's a good friend of mine, and when I read Austin Land, I'm like, this is a movie. Someday, in 10 years, we're going to get a camcorder and go to England, and we're going to make this. And which is kind of what we did, except it was not a camcorder, and we had a real director in the whole bit. But right. um, I just wanted to, when she wanted to do it for real, I wanted to be involved. I wanted to see it done right. And, and I also feel like there's these great stories that people haven't heard of, and Hollywood's not going to make that book into a movie unless there already are a bunch of screaming fans demanding it. They're not going to take the risk. But there are good stories. And they make so many bad movies that don't have good stories. Why don't we use what we have and make it happen? And, you know, we tend to pick books by, by female authors with female protagonists. And we try and have as many people, female people working on the film. And it feels important. I feel like there need to be more female viewpoints.
I can't see the audience very well, but I do feel like they're, they might be mostly women. I think, I think we have a lot of right. female viewpoints of us at the moment. <laughs> um, I think something that women do is assume they can't do something. Like, so it's very interesting to me that you dove into this totally new industry and, and thought, okay, you know what, I'm going I'm to be able to do this. How, what was I mean, I know I'm not uh, as experienced, right. but we learned while we were doing it. You know, right. we were already there, already a part of the same, and there's so many different kinds of producers, and some of them have to have a very high level of technical ability. Um, but to be a creative producer, you just have to really love the story and be willing to fight and cry and complain and put your foot down and offer other solutions so you can try and make that story the way it should be. And you probably, did you feel like you had a good sense of it having watched the first couple of Twilight movies come together? I mean, I feel like I have a unique perspective because as an author who has had her movies adapted, mm -hmm. I kind of know the pitfalls for the author and I tend to be the author's advocate mm -hmm. on the set and try to make it what they want to see um, and keep them involved in the process. Are there projects right now that you're really excited that you can share with us? Well, I mean, we're filming down a dark hall right now in Spain. And can you tell us a little bit about what well, sort of story that is? Well, it's Lois Duncan, which is what I read when I was really little. And I loved her, her take on, like, the teenage voice, but then it's mixed in always with some supernatural element that made it more fun. Um, and this was the book that scared me the most when I was eight. And I, I loved it because I've never seen a ghost story that is quite so manipulative and, and cold. And, and it's, it's so interesting to me how someone can take something that is mystical and, and turn it into just, I don't know, a money-making scheme. It's very interesting to me. It's different than most ghost stories. And it also features a young girl's experience and this female mentor who seems like a really amazing person. Um, it resonated with me. Uh, the, my one big heartbreak is that Lois Duncan passed away, and she so nice. wanted to see it. And so that's been difficult for me to not, as we go forward, knowing that she won't be able to see it. Well, and she talked about how excited she was, right? She was, was really excited. Is there anything, any, any others that you're... Um, we are working on Anna Dressed in Blood and Not a Drop to Drink. We, we pretty much can't use a title that's not super long for some mm, reason. Kind of gothy. Um, I know. <laughs> but, we, you know, we find the stories that speak to us, and, and both of those where, you know, it's, it's hard. Getting a movie made with a female director is a chore. It is not a, the, an easy thing. Um, so it's just a work in progress. We keep going. Um, is, there, is, there a, you, is there a type of project? I mean, are you, are you drawn to spooky things? Do you feel like you're... I don't think so. I mean, and we have a lot of sort of seems we like have a it. sort of we have the the ghost thing going on. Right. But you know, Austin Land was just straight up That's fun, true. right? That's true, yeah. um, and we're also working on the Rook for television, which is also again so much fun. And that's also fun. a book, right? It is, and it's I highly recommend it. It's like if you took X Men and The Office and put them together. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, you wrote this book, The Chemist, four years ago. Is that right? About, yes. Is it? Uh, I have the feeling, and I, I've never had to wait that long before a book came out, but I always have the feeling when people are trying to talk to me about my most recent book, like they're kind of like trying to talk to me about high school. <laughs> I'm just like, what? I sort of remember what you're talking about. I mean, is it, is it strange? Does it feel a little bit like you're going, you're time traveling, talking about I mean, about I had this? to go back and kind of Did go you? through it again and be like, what <laughs> happens in this one? Okay. I'm good. Yeah, it's, it's been a while. It, it took a while. It was a long process, so it does, you definitely get that feeling. Are there, are, are there books in the future that you want to get to? Do you have a project in mind? There are a lot of books that are about eight chapters done. That uh, seems really? to be where I hit the wall. Yeah. Um, and, I, and there's some I'd really like to be getting to next. Um, unfortunately, I'm really bad. Stuff like this paralyzes me and slows Stuff me down. Stuff like talking to me? Yes. Like <laughs> talking to Rainbow. When I, ha I know I'm going to have to talk to you for like weeks in advance. I can't think right and I can't put the words down. You mean like pr promoting a book or, or a book coming promoting out? Promoting books, doing interviews. It's so distracting for me. I need to have more like, and then there's also like, you know, Thanksgiving. We've got a lot of turkeys to cook. You know, life gets in the way. And I, I don't think probably, I sure didn't realize how much of an author's job is just working on the books, not necessarily writing them. It almost feels like it's as much work on the flip side as it is on... Or more. <laughs> or more, and not the kind of work you necessarily like. Although, like I was saying, um, Shannon Hale loves editing. That's her favorite part. So every... Wow. I know, She's weirdo. just odd, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, so it's different for everybody. For me, it's the first draft. That's where it's magical and you're living in the world. And then after that, it's 
you know, mistakes and fixing. And there is some, when you find a better sentence and a better word, right. and, and, and it suddenly flows together, you come up with a new character that you can sandwich in that you love, you know, there's still those good moments, but it's not quite the same as just writing. So, what genre are, you, are we going to see you go to next? What's your big shift? Okay. I, I feel can't. like something gentle, maybe, after killing all these people. I wish. I'm not sure what's wrong with my, my subconscious, because things have not been super... Uh, I mean, the thing I'd like to do next, and there are no guarantees, because you never know. I'm eight chapters in. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'd, it's a high fantasy novel, oh, which I grew up really? reading a lot of fantasy. And I, for me, I always felt like that was a natural place for me to go, but I'm sure I'll get the same thing, like, this is such a strange thing for you. But, I mean, I read everything. I don't see why I can't be allowed to write everything. Right. I <laughs> I agree. I agree. Um, well, thank you so much for answering thank all you. of my questions. Um, I think we are now going to start answering other people's questions. I'm warning you they won't be as good. Well, right? Obviously. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Obviously. But, um, okay, so I'm a little nervous. This is the technical part of our evening. All right. Well, and I'm ex really excited works. for it to go super well. <laughs> um, but we are now going to be joined by fans Chloe Palka. Elena Rains, and booktubers Natasha Paulus and Christine Riccio. And, ah! Yeah, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Hello. Okay, well, they all have questions for you, Stephanie, and Chloe is going to kick us off. Right, I can see them right here, so I'm not ignoring okay. them. I'm looking at them at the camera. <laughs> Hi, Stephanie. Hi. Um, congrats on the release of The Chemist. Thank you. Um, I know you mentioned the Bourne Legacy as one of your inspirations for the movie, but I was wondering what other kind of research you had to do for uh, the book, because it seems like there'd be a lot of cool spy stuff for you to pull from. Um, it was interesting. I did a lot of medical research because um, with Alex being kind of a doctor and also getting into a lot of chemical things, I, uh, I had, there's a chemistry professor at ASU, and this is all in the acknowledgments because this is the most research and the most help I've ever had, and she was amazing. I don't know how many hours she spent going over, let's see, how can we make it hurt more when we torture people? Um, she was fantastic, and then, you know, and then I, I, had the, I have a wide range of a big family and a lot of friends, particularly through church, and they all know people, and so I didn't have to go too far afield. Somebody had a brother in the NSA, and somebody used to work in the JAG Corps, and, and then I have a close personal friend who's in the Coast Guard and used to be a cop, and so I can go to these people and just say, okay, this is how I want to kill someone. Tell me if I'm doing it right, what's the best way, what are the tools I should have? That's not what everyone gets out of church, but I'm glad you are <laughs> dead. I know, right? <laughs> I meet the, I, ha I have the coolest friends, it's really true. Um, but so, you know, I, I was able to sort of search out, but I did have to talk to a lot of strangers, which isn't my favorite, and a lot of really smart strangers, um, which is very intimidating. Um, I spoke to a man who invented Synergis, which is this vaccine for RSV and is on like the cutting edge of what can be done. Um, and it was the whole conversation. And I'm writing down key words like, this will make me sound smart. Um, <laughs> And he was very nice to me, but he gave me this great backstory to do with Alex where she had this specialized background that I felt was what she needed. Um, but that, that wasn't, it wasn't easy. I don't like having to talk to strangers, so there's that. <laughs> well, I feel like we should have said, Chloe, that you were the senior editor of Fangirlish. Thank you so much for your awesome. question. Yes, thank you so much. All right, now we're going to move on to Elena Rains, who is the former owner of Twilightish. Elena. Hi, Stephanie. Hi. Um, one of my favorite things about all of your all of your books is the strong female characters that you write, and I was wondering what uh, your process is in writing your female protagonists, and how much time you spend like focusing on their uh, personality traits and considering your readers when you um, are writing those characters. Um, well, I mean, it sounds kind of mean. I don't consider the readers. Um, I can't. They're, like I said, there's too many people who need too many different things. Um, but the characters tend, some of the characters take a little work, but a lot, mostly my main characters show up pretty fully formed. As, as I come up with the idea for the story, they flesh themselves out. I don't have to do a lot of work. I don't know, I think Rainbow, you were saying it was kind of similar, where the characters, yeah. you know them, yeah. you know what they listen to and what they'd say in any given situation and what their favorite nail polish color is. And, and uh, with Alex, uh, 
in fact, my editor trimmed back a little bit some of her quirks because she, there was this whole thing. She can't sleep unless she has freshly brushed her teeth, and it drives her nuts if she doesn't have a minty, fresh mouth. And that was in there uh, too much, I guess, and the whole thing got pulled. Um, but so I know this about her. I feel like I would know her if I walked up to her on the street. I would, I would recognize her because she is who she is. Um, and as far as, you know, strong female characters, uh, they, again, they are part of their story, and that's who she was. And yes, she is extremely strong. She has a very strong stomach. She can do just about anything that she has to do, um, which I admire a lot. But I think the thing that I subconsciously, what I shared with her, what I was looking for, um, there's no break for her. It's not like someone else is going to come along and make this work out. She has to fix it. Anything that gets broken, she's going to have to do it. And I think that most people probably recognize that feeling, like I am going to have to clean this mess up at the end of the day. No one's going to do it for me. Um, and, and, and it's not a restful way to write. I think it's more fun to write when there will be a superhero that's going to come in and save the day. But it's a more realistic way to write, We're sadly. all alone. Yeah, we're all alone. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for your question. I think we're, we're going to get a question now from Natasha Polis, a.k.a. YouTuber. I hope I say it. I should have checked Tosh, Tosh Polis. Ah, <laughs> all right. Um, and winner of the Twilight Storytellers Project. Um, okay, so I really love reading uh, the different booby traps and ways to kill someone that your main character has. See, Rainbow? Someone liked it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It was really interesting. Um, so I want to know what was your favorite booby trap in The Chemist? I liked a lot of them. Um, it would be so great to have some of those options. But I think the one, if I could only have one, it would just be the little knockout gas in the little small bottle. Because sure, if your life is in danger, um, you know, that's great. But it's also great if someone's just really being annoying. Um, <laughs> you know? Done. I, you know, they have a headache, Nikki. What happened? I don't know. You were so tired. You just passed right out. So it's so versatile. And that's why that's my favorite. When we were talking about this book after I read it and I was like excitedly texting you about it, um, you said, well, some, you know, sometimes you just feel like you have to kill a few people. Do you know what I mean? And I was like, well, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> She'll get there. I'll get there. <laughs> Her books are so lovely. Oh, thank you. They yes. are. And I, I reread Attachments as my personal favorite. And I read it all the time when I just am having like oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, a, a dark day. But I do feel like at some point you're going to want to pull the trigger. If you want, I can like take your personal copy of Attachments and write something really nasty at the end. I'm <laughs> <laughs> just like, no, no, no. I love my beautiful escape. Okay, but I'm just okay. saying at some point you're going to want to kill. We all do. Okay. <laughs> now we're going to, it's Christine Riccio, yeah? Hi, Christine. Yeah, okay. Christine, go for it. Okay. Um, so I wanted to know, if you had to assign one song as, like, the anthem for The Chemist, what song would that be? Okay. Here's another answer where I'm a little behind, because I have a playlist for this one. It's not online yet. I just need to, to type it up and send it off. Um, so I know which... I kind of have songs that move throughout. I think the first one that went on the playlist... Uh, was Dangerous by Big Data. That was the one that like, okay, this, this is starting to feel like the vibe. There's a lot of the neighborhood on there. There's some royal blood. There's a little bit of TV on the radio. Um, but So I'll have that someday on the site where we'll have specific answers for all these songs. Thank you so much, Christine. Thank you. I'm wondering, uh, do you have different playlists for every book? I do. Cool. I tend to, with this one, I actually was creating it as I was writing it. And some of it's newer that got added later as mm -hmm. I was refining things. But I like to listen to the music that has the right emotional vibe while right. I'm writing. It kind of helps keep me in that space. I do the same thing. Okay. Well, I think we're, I said, I, I don't know why I'm muttering. I did the same thing. <laughs> I do the same thing, Stephanie. <laughs> Much like successful author Stephanie Meyer, I also do that. Um... All right, well, we have more questions. It's just, I feel like it's kind of like, and now to Australia, but, <laughs> and now to the audience. Um, a few of you have given us questions, and I'm actually going to ask them. I'll try to do your voice when I do that. <laughs> no, okay, this, this question is from Spirit McMahon. Are you here, Spirit? In, she's here on Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> puns, really? It's puns that get you. Okay. It's puns. What is a piece of advice you would share with a young writer? Don't make it too good because they're all competition. 
That is an excellent uh, point. That's how I feel. Well, I mean, I've answered this question before, and the answer is always the same. If you want to write, write. Do not spend all your time stressing out about who your audience is and who's going to read it. Write the book that you want to read. If you're not enjoying rereading it when you go back to look at it, if you've like, written a few chapters and you come back and, oh, I hate this, and you're not in the story, then maybe start over, because you should enjoy it. You should be having fun. And then after you're done, then start worrying about publishing and finding agents and do your research online. There's a lot of information there. But so many people I talk to who want to write, their big concerns are like, how do I find an agent? And, and where do I find a publisher? And I'll say, well, you know, how, where's your book at? I haven't started yet. It's like, no. <laughs> Don't let, that part is not the fun part. That's the awful part. Leave that part out and write the story. And then you can do the awful part if you really still want to be published. Good answer. But write a horrible book so there's no competition. Right. right. Okay, excellent. I mean, maybe just give up because it's really hard. <laughs> so hard. I so recommend hard. writing eight chapters and then <laughs> start something new. But really, if, if you had... It isn't as if, like, when you wrote Twilight, people were clamoring for vampire romance teen novels. That was, like, five minutes after you wrote Twilight, thanks to you. But, like, you can't write that way, is, I think, no, what you're No, if you're trying to hit what is, what's, what's out there, what people want, you're going to miss it by about a year, because it's exactly. going to take that long to get out there. And, in fact, when I wrote my book, I got a rejection letter from uh, one of the agencies that rejected me that said, we just don't think that there's a place for vampires in fiction right now. And I was also had a movie um, company that said vampires are just not what people want to see. And I mean, I might have ag agreed with them a little bit. You know, it's, it's, it was very specific to me. But if you're waiting for someone to say this is the only subject that you can write on, that's right. don't. Do whatever you want. And if everyone has written a vampire book, but you have a really great story and it's new and fresh, it'll make it even though vampires are over. I agree. I would like to read one of your vampire books. If, you, if you're going to write, do that. Um, okay. <laughs> This comes from, oh, I didn't write this, so I can't write the hand. I'm, now I'm throwing this person under the bus who wrote this. I think it's Monica. I, I feel like it's Monica. Um, this is a very Monica question. You have a knack for developing unforgettable characters. Oh, she's buttering you up. Very um, nice. As a high school English teacher trying to develop writing um, for students, what advice can you share for character development? It, it kind of comes to me naturally. I've always... Um, just loved imagining stories about people. So maybe, I mean, the stuff that we do, ask your students if they know what the favorite song is and what they would do on Friday night and what their favorite TV show is. And, and you know, if you ask them a question, butternut squash or oregano, what's their answer going to be and why? You know, think about your character. Spend time with them. The story shouldn't shape the character. The character should shape the story. And so if you know your character and what they're going to do, that's going to inform all of the action that takes place. Um, and I think a lot of times, you know, in English, you're writing a little short story and maybe people aren't getting that invested. But try and make your students think about who this person is and how they would live their whole life. Who knows? Maybe one of those kids will write down that whole story, and then we'll have some competition. Right. Yeah. We'll be dead then. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheerful. Yeah, well, okay. Um, y y yes, and, and to kind of add to that, I think what I love about your stories is um, plot, the plot comes out of the characters a lot of times. So if, if the characters are really... I think people get very hung up on plot and very hung up on, like, a gimmick. But if you have really good characters, sometimes that, the, char the plot comes out of the characters. Would you agree? They'll just do their thing. And if yeah. they're interesting, it'll be an interesting thing. Well, I have another question for you from the audience. Um, this one is from Teresa. What do you do when writer's block hits? Do you push through or step back and have a go? Do you have a go-to plan of action for seeking inspiration? I just quit. Just <laughs> give up. Apparently. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a huge quitter. Um, it's, it's interesting because writer's block has come to me in different ways. When I started out and people asked me that question, I'd be like, <laughs> writer's block? You know, what's that? I didn't get it originally. I was so invested in the stories and it just came and it was like I'd, I'd not had such a good creative outlet my entire life. And it, so it was just like someone turning a sink onto full and it was all just pouring out. But then the water dropped, the water level, and it, it started, went back to a trickle. Um, and so now with, with writer's block, I tend to switch projects, which does not make things happen very fast. But if one project, for example, we were talking earlier about the sequel to The Host, which I would love to write. Earlier today when we were hanging out together. 
not earlier right. in this conversation. We were hanging out, and it was so cool. It was really it was so cool. Amazing. We were playing video right. games. So the host awesome. is the host sequel, which is called The Seeker, is Ooh, eight, that's eight nice. chapters in, and I know the entire plot, and I have the whole thing laid out. Um, it's and really tantalizing for people who would love to have that. You're just like, here's the title. I've written eight chapters. I'm never going to finish it. Well, no, I, I will. <laughs> Sometime on my deathbed, I'll have someone, I'll, I'll say it, and they'll be transcribing for me. Um, but, you know, things, it's odd. Emotional things really affect me in my writing. And the host movie, which I loved making, it was one of the best movie experiences I've ever had. The reception to it was so negative that it shut off a lot of that emotional outlet for me because it was just such a, it was a difficult thing. Because if it had just been me, that was one thing. But this director and these actors who I loved and they were getting trashed over what I still think is a beautiful movie. And maybe I'm just being arrogant, but it was so beautifully done. Um, <laughs> You were fishing for that so hard, but you got it. I was. Got I, it. I got it. I got, <laughs> got it. it. Um, you know, and, be, and when, some, when you have your, your dream and you put it out in the world and then someone steps on it, it, it messes things up. And I'm hoping that having had some other stories that'll, that'll clean the palate. Um, I know that doing that um, gender swapped version of Twilight oh, yeah. was so oddly, like, refreshing. It was the sorbet between, between, you know, meals. It was so, wow, this is so much fun to be back to just the story by itself again. And so sometimes you just kind of have to have those moments in writing where it's you and the story. And so I hope to get back to that one. But it, it is, it's weird how things block you. And then I do a different project. So it really stinks that like, success, I think, can be, success can be a big cause I of I think success block. gets in a lot of people's way. Yeah. It's not a helpful thing. So all of you want to be huge successful authors. It's not always something that's going to make you a better writer, for sure. Yeah, don't succeed. <laughs> I feel like this is going to work, this plan of ours, to shut out <laughs> I mean, all I didn't talent. see this coming, but it feels very productive. It feels good, actually. Yeah. Okay. Oh, man. We're, 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 this is, we're close to the end, guys. I don't want it to be, be over, but I do have, I have two more questions. This one's from Becky. Uh, what character in The Chemist do you identify with? This could be very revealing. There's some scary people in The Chemist. Well, I mean, as we discussed, I, I feel like Daniel and I have a lot in common because, I mean, he's attractive and smooth, but he's also helpless. <laughs> <laughs> and I have that going for me. Um, and then I, I, get, I, I get Alex in a lot of ways. I'm not as brilliant as she is, but I, I have a similar, you know, like she likes to think her way through things all the way, and then she acts. And I get that about her. I feel like I have nothing in common with Kevin. What about Val? I wish, right? <laughs> no, I love Val. I've known people similar to Val, wow. um, and I can get along with them, which mm -hmm. I, I like. You know, it's someone that I can, I can be friends with, but I could never be Val because she's very confident. For those of us who haven't heard, for, not me, but for people, it's just kind of a femme fatale character, would you say Oh, that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. She is the ultimate, every spy movie, the beautiful yeah. bombshell who knows she's a beautiful bombshell. Right. She was, at one point, one of two hookers in the novel. Oh, my gosh. Um, and Vivian got killed. I felt bad for that. She was fun. She was, like, the low-budget version. But she was way more into it. Like, she was gung-ho. That's, like, 200% more hookers than are in any of your other novels. <laughs> I know, but, you know, I had this discussion with my editor, and I'm like... Why not? The more hookers, the merrier. But she did not agree. <laughs> Moving on. Okay. This is from Amanda, and there's actually, it looks like there's an exclamation point. So, Amanda! Um, your previous books have relied heavily on supernatural themes, whereas The Chemist is based on a character that has to follow natural laws. Which did you prefer? And was it, was it because it was easier? I mean, I think natural laws are easier because we know them, and right. you don't have to create a mythology for something that already exists. Um, and so, and as long as you're following those rules, you're not wrong. Um, I did a lot of research. All the things that she does in this book are completely and totally possible, so mm -hmm. I followed natural laws throughout. I actually thought some of it would be more science fiction until I talked to the really smart people, and they're like, no, no, we can totally do that. We can... <laughs> We can control your minds and make you do whatever we want. It's like, that's so comforting to know oh, wow. that that's in the world. Um, but mythology is fun when you're creating a supernatural world because it's, you know, it's, they compare writing books to childbirth a lot. And it's such a creative process um, when you are creating something that doesn't exist. And that's why I'm kind of excited about the high fantasy because this one is not even on the planet Earth. Oh, it wow. is in a world with different continents and different peoples and different different things that they can do that we don't have and and that's comes completely from you and so that can feel really great um but it's not as easy yeah 
Well, I hope that you write that high fantasy novel. I would like I to read so. it. I hope so. Do you know that I've talked about it? Oh, yeah. if I don't, it'll be so bad. You have to now. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing. You've got to be accountable. <laughs> well, I would like to thank you for spending this time with all of us. I'd like to thank you for coming and everyone who's watching on Facebook Live. I think it's probably two to 12 people, but I want to thank them. Hi to all six of you. All six of you. Thank you for tuning in and possibly your mothers and pets. Um, <laughs> and I would like to thank Changing Hands for hosting us. And, and they're going to come. Yeah, thank you. All right, so let's give Stephanie another round of applause. Oh, like a real one. Well, and then please one for Rainbow because yeah, she's way louder, more entertaining. Louder. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Stop. Quieter, quieter. Okay, well, now Changing Hands is going to come give us some instructions uh, because we're going to go use the bathroom and then, and then sign like, all of your books. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, as she mentioned, I am from Changing Hands. My name is Lauren, so thank you all for coming tonight. Um, if you all don't mind staying seated just for a little bit longer, I'm just going to explain how the signing is going to work tonight. Um, I am happy to reiterate what Rainbow said. They are both signing tonight, which we're really excited for. Yeah. Um, so Stephanie will be signing here on stage. We actually have a whole setup behind this curtain here. So once we lift the curtain, we'll be lining you all up by letter group. So if you purchased your book from us, you got either a signing ticket or some sort of ticket with a letter group on it. So we'll be lining you up.